<laughs> we're not dead. We're alive. <laughs> we're doing things behind the scenes. Yeah. Yeah. I know. Yeah. We um we're excited to be back with this episode. Um we'll get it's into been a topic in- it's been a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, but yes, we are revamping. We have been doing a lot of interior internal work behind the scenes uh, about our organization and kind of who we are and what we're hoping to do and whatnot. Um, I feel a little bit like we're alligators, you know, we just kind of took a chunk out of this. We just took a bite out of what we were doing and then we started chewing and then we were like, huh, maybe we should actually think about what we take a bite out of. (laughs) Yeah. Let's take a step back and reevaluate and yeah, make sure we're offering like what we want to actually be offering. So. Yes. Yeah. And it's been good. It's been fruitful, but that's why we've been so dead gum quiet. Yeah. So, but we're coming back. We're coming back, starting with the podcast and i um, very excited about this one. But as part of our revamping, one of the things that we want to do with our podcasts uh, and one of the things that we've identified about ourselves is that we want to talk about messy stuff you know, and not just the cervical mucus. Like we want to talk about all of the messy things, all of the messy parts of this lifestyle and how like we let's grapple with the mess. Cause this is what a lot of people are too afraid to touch. Yeah. No, I'm not still talking about cervical mucus, although that is definitely there. Um, all right. You're not talking (laughs) about literal messy. I mean, although I guess you could be, it's just, we could be, yeah, we've identified that people like to talk about the beautiful stuff and we do too, but that's just not reality. Life is both. And so we want to go and talk about the stuff that makes us uncomfortable because ultimately like that's really helpful and in healing and growing and like becoming a better person is talking about the messy stuff. Yeah. And knowing you're not alone. That's like 95% of it. It's like, I can't necessarily take away the problem, but like, it ain't just you. Like that's such a huge relief that I know like you and I have both experienced. So what we're going to do is with our episodes now, we're going to start off with just a little five minute kind of cold open with what's been messy in our lives lately. Yeah. So thought this would be just kind of a fun, a fun way to get back into it. So um, and we can ask our guests too. Oh yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. probably shouldn't give that away. I, I kind of want to. Oh yeah. On them. Just forget about that. Yeah. Never forget mind. about it. It's kind of fun to, it's kind of fun to spring stuff on people. It is. It's kind of wrong, but fun. It is wrong, but fun. Why but are like, things that are wrong? So fun. I know. I don't know, <laughs> but why don't you start? What's your messy? Oh yeah. Well, we had a crawfish boil this weekend, our annual crawfish boil. So it's like peak mess. And I remember the first time we ever threw a crawfish boil, you know, in the DC area the thing you have to understand about the DC area is that whenever you go to like a backyard barbecue type thing, you're still dressing nice. Okay. So, and I knew this. And so the first time I boil, I had to like, I had to make very explicitly clear to people, like you wear your gross clothes. Yeah, of course. This is not a backyard soiree where you're busting out your seersucker, right? Like you're wearing your clothes that you sweat in at the gym that already smell to high heaven because you're going to get crawfish juice on it. And I cannot guarantee that stuff's coming out. So It was really funny. Like when I was adamant, I actually had people come back. They're like, wait, are you sure? Are you serious? Like, this is what we're wearing. I was like, yes. (laughs) They want to dress up when they come in over to your house on a weekend. Yes. And so I was like, no, this is not, this is not a DC backyard thing. This is a crawfish boil. We get messy. So this was our third one that we've had in our, in our house. And it's the best, like the friends that we have come over, they literally schedule life events around this crawfish boil. Like my uh, two years ago, my goddaughter was born the day that we threw the crawfish boil, like at three 30 in the morning. And I was on call to go pick up her big brother. Um, and then threw a crawfish boil later that day, let's just say that I started out the day feeling drunk without drinking any alcohol. Um, but so her birthday always co- coincides with our crawfish boil. And my friend literally plans her birthday party around when she knows. I love it. Happening fabulous see I get this because I'm from south but a lot of our listeners are not going to understand like the value of a a nice crawfish boil especially where you are in Virginia but oh yeah you get it once you go you get it you know get out of your comfort zone a little bit and try it and well and this year we had some some new some old friends new first time at a crawfish boil and she's originally from Connecticut and it was super fun Okay, I don't say, know what that means originally from Connecticut. 
I mean, she has no idea what to do with a crawfish. So I am literally having to teach how to peel, but like, she's also having to get past the fact that she can look her food in the face. Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm, So there's like a little bit of level of squeamishness. And I was like, you know, I was easing her in with the potatoes and corn and undoey. Right. Okay. So she gets into the crawfish and I'm explaining to her how how to peel. Now in years past, I had fun getting real graphic and I was like, all right, rip the head off. And then like, you know, if you want to suck it, go for it, you know? And they're just like, I want to just curl into a ball and die. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, so she, you know, I teach her how to peel it. Well, she rips it out and she sees of course the, the fat, which those of you who do not know what the fat on a crawfish looks like, it's yellow and it just looks gross. It looks like the nastiest thing you've ever seen in your life. It looks like cat vomit, but it tastes amazing. And if you can get past the cat vomit and you actually take a bite of it, you're like, I'm never going back. So she looks at this and she's like, what is that? And I was like, that is the crawfish fat. And it is amazing. Just give it a try. I don't think she tried it, but she did try a crawfish <laughs> and she loved it. She loved the corn. She loved the potatoes. Um, yeah, we have a blast. My daughter tried crawfish for the first time this year. I was like, get it girl. We told her, we were like, honey, you can eat kimchi. She literally eats, my six-year-old eats kimchi, which for those of you who don't know what that is, it is basically Korean sauerkraut, I guess is the way to describe it. It's fermented cabbage, but tastes amazing. Uh, I was like, honey, if you can, and it's really spicy. If you can eat kimchi, you can eat crawfish. And so she tried it and she loved it. I was like, fantastic. Like, but you're going to have to learn how to peel your own because I ain't doing this all day. absolutely. (laughs) For those of you, yeah. I told Bella, you're six. It's time to learn how to peel your own crawfish. That's right. That's good parenting (laughs) in South Louisiana. It's like, listen, I am not, when you turn six, I am no longer peeling your crawfish. If you want to eat, you learn to peel. That's right. That's right. So that was my weekend. It was fantastic. Sweet. I love the literal mess there. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Mine has reeked. Mine is less of a, a literal mess, although I wish I had crawfish had had crawfish this weekend. But girl, no. don't even with me. Don't even. I know. I can't complain. <laughs> I cannot complain. I you admit. live in the promised land. I You're don't want to totally hear. You're totally true. You're totally true. You're totally right. Um, no, my messy. I'm just I'm just recognizing the past few weeks how tired and fatigued I've been getting when I don't like. I say take care of myself, but like, like. <laughs> But what I'm realizing is like taking care of myself. I don't mean just like eating and bathing and like doing those things, but like, I really need rest. (laughs) Like I'm learning the value of rest and I, it's just been knocking me out. Like I need time to myself. That's what I mean. Like we don't always see that as, as, um, taking care of ourselves, but like, I need some me time, whether that's like sitting down and watching TV, taking a nap in the middle of the day or doing some writing. If I don't get to that and I'm just, then I'm just like, I'm just like running myself ragged. So yeah, that's been a little bit rough. So I've been trying to work and talk to Chris, like, like telling him when I need help. And so it's been a really good learning experience too, but also just like, I don't know if I'm just like getting older or what, but but finding ways to work that in. So I don't know if anybody else experiences that, but learning your limits and accepting them and working with them blows chunks, (laughs) but it's good. (laughs) Somebody shared with me recently. I thought this was awesome. Um, Like, you know how in like the Jewish faith, like when we think about the Sabbath, like the Sabbath starts at sundown, but like every, all of their days start at sundown. And if you think about what that means, that means that the day starts with a meal and with sleep. And I was like, hot dog. Yeah, if we just think that. about it in those terms, that that food and rest are not rewards for the work of the day. They're how you start the day. Yes. I was like, that. I, I love, love that. that. Yeah, I love I'm, that. I'm just like, I got to do this and I got to do that. And I got to, mm-hmm. you know, and it's just prioritizing. It's not selfish, right? It's prioritizing no. self-care, which yeah. is just, I know. It's like, recogn- well, it's it's so recognizing easily. your limits, which I think this is a cultural thing. Like we, but I think there is a shift happening that like yeah. you, we don't have limits. You work and you're good because like you work, you know, sixty hour days or whatever. You know, yeah. Um, you work beyond your limits, and we're realizing that that's not sustainable. It's producing a lot of problems, and there's a lot yeah. of pushback. So. Yeah. Relax. Speaking of limits, I was just about to say, what a great, <laughs> what a great, great bridge. Great minds. I love yes. it. 
Yeah. So today's, today's topic, we are, so we're coming off of infertility awareness week and we are moving into mother's day coming up in a couple of weeks. So we miss infertility awareness week, but this is still a very important and um, relevant conversation. The conversations between fertile and infertile women. And um, a lot of things, first of all, Mary and I have had a lot of these conversations and they were tricky at first. Um, but there's something really beautiful to be had about really, I, I don't want to say just being vulnerable because you have to be careful about who you're vulnerable with. But when you know that there is a willingness to receive what is offered when you're vulnerable and there's, even if it's messy, even if it like comes out wonky or like not the way that you want it to, there's a commitment to saying, okay, can I try that again? Right. That there is even when you mess up, it's like, okay, I could have done that better. Like you, you come back to that repair of like, let's go, let's try to have this conversation in a better way. Um, so yeah, we kind of just wanted to, to talk about the messiness of, of this, because I know that the world health organization just came out with their new statistics and it's actually one in six. It, I think, is it people or just women, like men and women or women? The, the, the stat I've always been familiar with is like as couples. So okay. I imagine it's referring to both. Okay. So one in six couples then have, are, are infertile. Yeah. Um. So it used to be one in eight. Now it's one in six. So what was it? 17.25% of the people that we know are infertile. So yeah. this is a huge swath of people. So you likely know at least have. one person that yeah. is infertile. I mean, maybe you don't know it because they haven't shared it, but the fact is that that yeah. we're we're all around. <laughs> yeah. But I wanted to go ahead. You want to say something? Well, I just it's it's one of those things that it it's hard. There's there's kind of it's a chicken and egg question, I think ultimately. Because on the one hand, you have infertile women who it's hard for you to bring this topic up. On the other hand, you felt you feel like you can't bring this topic up because it's not acknowledged, but it's not acknowledged because it's not known. And so what which something has to happen, like there has to be a somebody makes a move first. Who makes yeah. it when and how? I think varies relationship to relationship, but we're just going to talk about how it's kind of panned out with you and I. Yeah, in all fairness, I think that this can be a struggle on both ends in a sense that like so many women have reached out to me in large part there's infertile women saying like you know so and so my close friend my family members they're getting pregnant I don't know how to be around them like this is really painful like do you have any advice but I also get a lot of women who have children and have close friends or family members who are infertile and they're like I want I want to to treat their heart well, do you have any any advice on how I can handle them? And that's been really encouraging. So I just want to identify like on both ends, people really do want to know how to talk to each other. And that's why we're doing this episode because Emily and I have kind of accidentally, I think, figured out how to do this well. And when I say well, I do not mean without difficulty in the sense of like, it hasn't just been easy and it hasn't come natural necessarily. Um, but also it doesn't mean that it's never like painful for me or, or painful for her to talk about things that that doesn't mean that doesn't exist, but like we have figured out how to, how to have a, have a close relationship despite these difficulties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think going back to like when we originally started talking about these things, it was around that project that we had uncharted territory. Mm -hmm. Um, and the whole point was bringing our opposite voices together, um, with our third friend, Jennifer, who has subfertility. The whole point here was I have a different experience with NFP from you and both of our experiences bring something to the table. So I think just the fact that we had that starting point of like your experience has value and I am curious about it. That I think that that foundation even though yeah, we like we had some interesting conversations. I remember like I was explaining way back I was sharing part of my experience with you and I like started crying because I was like how can she not see me? You know, like I, I even had that that experience of like how can she not get that this is hard for me? But you, I remember you took a step back and you received that and you were like, okay, yeah, no, I can see how this was hard. And just the fact that you saw that, I was like, oh, 
okay, she sees it. Okay, well now I wanna see her. What's your side of it? And so again, it's like a chicken and egg question, who sees who first, but that seeing of, okay, I see something's difficult for you. But then, but having that reciprocity, there's a mutuality here of not just you need to see my hard and I'm going to impose that on you. It's no, I have something hard and I see your hard, that there's space for both. I think that's the huge key here. It's, it's not a competition about whose hard is harder. It's nope, these are two different kinds of hearts. So Absolutely. let's, and, and the coolest thing is, is that the more that we've opened up about it, the more we find so much common ground. Like I know, I know we're always talking about this and we're always shocked by it. It's like, oh, we have very different experiences, but yet somehow very similar. Well, there's going to be a part of all of our suffering that is universal. And I think that's the goal that we forget. It's like we're, we're, we get stuck on the, the details, the superficial details, and there are a lot of differences and that's okay. But like the deeper we get, the more vulnerable we get, the more we learn about ourselves and each other, then we, we, we start to find that. I, I, I love what you said. It's simple when you were like, I don't, I honestly, I don't remember this conversation. I'm glad I'm like <laughs> to hear you explain it to me. Cause I don't remember. Um, but you said, um, when I said, what did you say? I said that like, oh, I can see how that's difficult or something. Yeah. You, whatever. I don't remember exactly what you said, but, but that it was, was what but it, you it were willing was. to like, yeah, yeah, you were willing to see my experience. It's not simple, but it, it kind of is that simple, like that yeah. little thing. But I got to say, I would have never been able to open up to you like that. If you hadn't like been willing to like sit with me in my pain a little bit just because I know mm -hmm. how difficult my this was one of the hardest parts for me it still is one of the hardest parts of infertility for me um is just being around other fertile women especially catholic fertile women I'm very guarded I have to keep my heart safe because it that like I said it's been such a struggle but what I found, and like Emily's saying, over over the years as, as our friendship has grown, I don't think it was any different in the beginning. Um, the only reason I was able to do that is because Emily was able to see me and sit in my discomfort. And you were able to do that because you learned you needed to sit with your discomfort, I think. And I wasn't actually at that point yet. Oh, okay. I, 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 I hadn't started therapy. I didn't know the value of sitting in my own crap. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I haven't learned that lesson yet. That was forthcoming, but I think that that was kind of the start of it. Yeah. Um, that without realizing what I was doing of what I was receiving, it was that there was this mutual seeing and the power but, but what I mean, I want to interrupt you really quick because what yeah, I mean is that you didn't like when you were suffering and mm -hmm. you didn't like how you were treated. That's what I was getting at is like, yes, somebody was just like, oh, it's going to be fine. Or like, pregnancy is beautiful like that part yes and, and I always got the idea that like that was a part like you weren't going to do that to me and yeah. you didn't and um that gave me a lot of freedom and of course these were baby steps I'm not like we didn't jump into this but um that's what I've learned is the value of that vulnerability with someone who feels safe like Emily said yeah. you're not going to just go open up your life story to everyone um we've yeah. all made that mistake I made it last Ooh, week, I'm sure. So. <laughs> um, but but like just to take baby steps with your your close friends and family members, I find these are the people that at least women are reaching out to me like, like what do I do now? Mm -hmm. And um generally speaking, those are gonna be your safe people because if, if they're getting pregnant, um, you do wanna be a part of their lives. We're talking about like both things coexisting. Um, absolutely without a doubt, you can be happy for your friends, genuinely happy for them getting pregnant and growing their family, but also feel your grief at the same time. Both mm -hmm. things can, can happen. Likewise, your friend can receive that you are happy for them, but also like going through some stuff. Mm -hmm. And, and that's the value we're talking about. If this is the level your friendship is at, what your friendship and your heart is going to benefit from is sharing, like sharing both of those things. Yeah. Yeah. You know? And I think this is something that I think just generally speaking that we don't really understand and don't know how to implement is that two supposedly conflicting emotions can exist at the same time. Yep. Right. Um, and I know that we experienced this when I found out I was pregnant with my third and I, you know, told you, and I was, and I, 
because we had had so many conversations and because I was actually coming off of experiencing secondary infertility, I was like, I pretty much knew like, okay, I'm going to send you a text. I'm going to tell you what happened. And then you take all the time you need to process and then come back to me. And, you know, it, I'm willing to hear kind of where you are with this news. And I even like, I remember we had some Marcos where I was just like, all right, how's this hitting? How's this going? I am willing to like hear. And of course, making space for that. It was like, I was also going through my own stuff of course, with having a third pregnancy of, and, and the way that it all transpired and everything. And so, but because we came into this with like, Hey, look, I understand that this is hard for you to receive. And I know that, you know, that this is kind of weird for me to experience Absolutely. as well. There was space for both. And I, I think that that's, again, going back to what I was saying in the beginning, it's not about trying to compete over whose heart is harder. It's about making space for both. I see your heart <clears throat> and here is my heart. And, and I think kind of going to this with, um, to use some Catholic virtues here, because we're Catholic, we're, this is what we talked about. Yep. Prudence and charity, you know, like just using a lot of prudence and charity. Like when we talk about being vulnerable, be prudent. Like, should I be vulnerable with this person? Can this person receive this at this time? Or do I need to actually like create some space? And that's also very charitable. Like you're considering like, hey, I need to talk to this person about this. Kind of what you're talking about with infertile women getting invited to, or finding out their friends are pregnant. They're getting invited to baby showers. Later on, they're going to get invited to baptisms. You know, for an infertile woman, you're like, I don't want to hurt my friend. I want to be there for my friend. But also I have to acknowledge the fact that this is something very painful for me to attend. And so how to balance those two things. And again, if you just make space for each other's internal experiences, that's, that's a good first step. Now, how to have open that conversation. This was something I was thinking about as we were talking about doing this episode. Um, Cause you mentioned this to me and I came back to you with, if I didn't know that this was this painful for you as an infertile woman, the fact that you have explained to me and told me, and we've kind of built this friendship around our, our honesty and our mutual vulnerability. I know, like, if I find out I'm pregnant, I'm going to deliver the news in a very particular way. And I am not going to talk about certain things, again, being prudent with my pregnancy with you out of consideration, because I understand what's going on. But if I didn't know that, Now, of course, once I know it, it's like, oh, right. No, duh. But it's not something that comes natural to me. Like, I wouldn't think about that of my own accord if you hadn't told me. And so one of the things I was thinking about is like, when you talk about friendships between fertile and infertile women, I think the case a lot of infertile women come, or a lot of the issue that comes into play is because y'all haven't felt comfortable to talk about this. How do I bring this up? Because it's so painful. It's like overwhelming to bring it up. When you get into these situations, like how do I talk about this with my friend? Because it's like, you're bringing up so much at once. And so just the thought of bringing that up is, I mean, it's overwhelming in the beginning, but then with a friend that you are friends with, because you're almost, I don't want to say like bringing up that you've been lying, but you're bringing up a part of your heart that has not been brought up in the friendship before. That's always Mm -hmm. been there. Mm -hmm. And I, it's both difficult to bring forward and I can imagine it's also difficult to receive like, you know, Oh yeah. Why haven't you told me about this before? And then, you know, moving past that and being like, Oh, right. I understand why you haven't told me this before. Oh yeah, there's surely a lot to consider. And I think that thankfully it is something that people are talking more about now and the Mm -hmm. awareness is growing. And um, I think we're playing a little uh, catch up here. So like, I think women are realizing, oh, I can talk about this or they're hearing other women talk about it, thankfully. And it's like, oh, okay, this is something that I can say out loud. I think for so long, it was just, this is just something I do alone. Other people aren't struggling with this. Just going to keep it to myself. It's embarrassing. I am suffering. I feel broken. I don't want people to know this about me. All the different things that are going through our heads. And, and so I think that in that silence, you know, for so long, there are, yeah, there are a lot of friendships. I think we, we're just catching up and, and, mm-hmm. and saying like, okay, I can talk to this person about it. 
Um, and just, but just to say that, like, yeah, that is hard. I also want to mention too, um, you were talking about baby showers and baptism and birthday parties, the three B's, that's what I call them. <laughs> um, I want to acknowledge, cause I, I get this a lot in the conversations when, when women reach out to me too, that there's so many expectations. There's a lot of expectations in family. So I want to talk about boundaries. There are expectations that doesn't matter what's going on. You better be at this baby shower. Like this, your sister, mm -hmm. this, your, <laughs> yeah. this, your sister-in-law in this family, we show up for each other. Do you know what I'm talking about? I mean, this mm -hmm. is just not just about infertility. This is boundaries in general. And yeah. we haven't talked about those for a long time. So want to recognize that for some, some women, it is harder because that those boundaries are much more loose or non-existent in your families mm -hmm. um, or friendship circles. Um, yeah. Look, ultimately, that's their problem. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not saying this is easy, but I, but I want to say still, um, what we're saying about vulnerability still, it's still, um, that still makes sense. Like, that still matters. That's still valid. Um, but at the same time, you know, you might get some pushback. We're not saying that whenever you feel like you're going to draw a line or set a boundary that you're not going to get pushback, it's not going to be hard. Um, but in that case, like you still, your mental health is important. What you need to do for your own heart and your own mental health, that matters. Mm -hmm. um, did I come off too strong with that? No. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Of course, you ask you asking the wrong person. Reel me in if you, if if I need to be real dead. You ask me the, but, no. Um, I kind of I want to build off of that um, because you quoted this in your book, and I'm not going to be able to quote it um, perfectly. But the research that was done that talks about the um, that how infertility is this is similar in term, and I forget the wording. Yeah, help help me out answer. here. I'm stumbling. Um. Yeah. The that the 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 emotional part of it. Um, was equal to those women, those women who were suffering with cancer and cardiac mm -hmm. rehab and stuff like that. Yeah, it was a Harvard study. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the pain of infertility is emotionally equivalent to a terminal illness. Yeah. So yes, you can draw boundaries. You don't have to put yourself through emotional torture um, to make everybody happy. No, you don't have to do that. And if that is something difficult for you to do, we always recommend, we always want people to know therapy is absolutely yes. an option. Um, I wanted to ask you, because I know particularly within Catholic circles, which is what we know, um, in other circles as well, when I think about like why infertile women have had such a hard time speaking up, obviously there is the component of like, this is such a hugely painful experience, but there's other factors too. Number one, like particularly within Catholic circles, there's the presumption that if you don't have babies, you're on birth control. But then once you do start speaking up and you say that you're infertile, there's a lot of fixers out there. Oh, just go do NAPRO technology. Oh, just do IVF. Oh, just adopt, right? Have you thought, have you done this medical treatment? Have you done this diet plan? Oh, I know so-and-so. And once she had a glass of wine every night, she got pregnant, right? So, I mean, there's all of like these fixes that come in. Do you think that that, so the judgment and then the fixing once you do, the judgment when you're silent, the fixing once you do speak up, do you think that that's a factor in the silence for infertile women? Yeah, absolutely. It's also a factor of not being around anyone who's infertile and not mm -hmm. knowing and understanding what it really is to live it. I mean, I've talked to people recently that um, are completely, great Catholic women who just like, it's so foreign to them. Like I told one girl the other day, um, cause I was, I was at a church, um, trying to prepare those who suffer for mother's day, get handed, you know, providing some resources. And I was telling a friend who was just like, where were you or whatever? And she was just like, Oh, mother's day is hard. Oh, like, no, no. I'm like, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's really hard. I said, a lot of women I find don't even go to mass on Sunday because it is so difficult. And a lot of Catholic churches do all these things. And it was just, um, wonderful friend and woman lover to death. It wasn't yeah. something that upset me. It was just, oh, you really just don't know. Um, yeah. and she, she had a relative, she has a close relative who's infertile. So yeah. 
we're just it again it, we uh, and, you know we we can't expect people to know if we're not opening up mm-hmm. and sharing and um so yeah and I do think it's fair too on the other end that, that there's a lot of fear like what are they yeah. gonna say what stupid yeah. thing are they gonna say if I'm being real yeah. um and look and this is another part about being vulnerable and this is something I struggle with for a long time but not hiding your your hurt at the weird comments too yeah and like oh that's really, or I mean, whatever, however you want to respond, but not pretending Mm -hmm. like that didn't affect you. Um, Yeah. That's a really good, I mean, I I don't know, I'm not saying easy things here, but just being honest about our emotions. And that's where I think boundaries come back into play, you know? Um, By the way, you're not being mean if you tell somebody that what they said hurt you. You're being honest. And and you're, (laughs) excuse me, you're creating, (laughs) dang it, you're creating an opportunity for education. You know, it's not, Hey, you hurt me. Therefore you are a bad person. No, you hurt me with those words. And I understand that you probably have no idea how those words hit. Let me explain it to you. Cause I want, you know, I love you. I want to continue this relationship with you. Let me explain this to you. Um, and I know sometimes that's certainly going to be hard to receive because it's like, how do I not receive this as a, as an indictment? Right. But it's not, it's not an indictment. Um, well, and when you're, when you're vulnerable, when we say vulnerable, that means vulnerability is is extra hard because you're, you're, you're sharing, you're not being mean. You're showing someone how you really feel. You're showing the the difficulty and the pain that you're feeling. I think when you you can actually accomplish that vulnerability, isn't just sharing something that's hard. Or yeah. sharing something that you haven't vulnerability is, is being honest about how we feel underneath like the deep the pain and showing that pain mm-hmm. yeah and that's it, it, i think part of this too just in general is being able to share that type of stuff first of all you have to get comfortable with it yourself which is hard and so mm-hmm. i feel like to a certain degree probably this is very unfair but well not probably it is unfair i think there's a huge burden on infertile women to first of all bear the pain and suffering of infertility mm-hmm. and then to educate people about it yeah and that sucks yeah so it's you know that i think the point of why we wanted to do this episode was i don't know maybe Maybe you listen, maybe you and your, your infertile, fertile friends, listen to this episode. We'll just break the ice for you. Okay. We'll break the ice. And then be like, I don't know, use this episode. Just go up to your friend be like, Hey, I listened to this great episode about infertility and fertility. Like these two women talking, let's have a listen and just see what happens. You know, I, yeah. this is Liz, listen, you can use this however you want. Uh, we give you full permission. <laughs> use throw us under the bus be like be like hey i listened to this episode this podcast episode now i really want to have a conversation go for it yeah yeah you're right because we do have to we it does take a while to figure out ourselves how we're feeling and that's when i talk to women i'm like first you need to feel it like Mm -hmm. you because we do we do push it down and how to bury it ourselves and that's the truth um the point and and Ella we're not you don't have to you do this when you're ready this is not like this is something that you have to do right now to like manage your friendships not at all Mm -mm. um I mean I think the most freeing thing is that that well when we're healing we choose when we want to enter into the messy Mm -hmm. it's the same thing here we got to feel it ourselves figure out where we are and then when we're ready if you're ready you know let your friend or your family member in on this and just like let them see your pain that's not easy by any means but but there's a lot of fruit and I think that's the point that like if you're looking for a way because so many people do you have advice this is my advice um you know this is this can be very fruitful Mm -hmm. and like when you establish that you have that mutual respect that mutual openness it, like it's it you touched on this a little before it's really important for us as infertile women too again when you're safe we got to be able to recognize the challenges in our friends with children's lives. And that's what Emily was talking about. That's what, um, you know, I was able to do with Emily with some other friends. I mean, once, and it really helps once I'm seen, then I can, I can kind of go and be like, this is objectively difficult. Okay. (laughs) Like it doesn't Mm -hmm. matter. Like I can absolutely see that. Um, but again, the, the, the more Emily and I have learned to be vulnerable with each other, 
And it's the same with some other friends who who have been able to do the same thing with. Um, I always had to stay away from these things, but it has been, it's just been shocking for me. Once this mutual respect, like I said, is established, I have a desire. Okay. It's not something I ever thought that I'd have a desire to, to invest in like their family's lives and their children's lives. Um, I mean, you know, it doesn't, and I'm not saying some things aren't hard, but but that's just been surprising for me. But the the vulnerability is what has freed me to do that. And on the, I um, wanted to share too. I was just like, like an Emily, you kind of brought this up before, but I was just thinking when someone recently reached out to me asking me this about this advice, I realized I know how hard it is with baby showers and weddings and I'm uh, not weddings, you know, all the other things. Um, I the realized three B's. That, <laughs> the three B's. If Emily were to get pregnant or have a baby shower like I just like I don't know I just realized like she would not just like with your pregnancy announcement like you didn't expect me to like have this reaction or Mm -hmm. or anything like that and I I just know Emily would completely understand if I couldn't if I felt like I needed to not go to her baby shower would it wouldn't be something I need to like talk to her about because we've established this she would probably say look you're invited I would love if you're here but I understand if it's not going to be good for your heart. And yeah, I would, I would tell you, like, I'm not going to hide this from you. Yeah. Like this is happening, um, but you can say no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, yeah. And if I chose to say no, um, which I still to this day, don't really go to many, I would mm-hmm. say, I so appreciate that. Thank you so much for thinking of me and, and inviting me. I'm so happy for you, but yeah, I'm going to sit this one out or, or whatever. And it would yeah. be fine. So I just kind of reflecting on that and be like, okay, how do we get to this point? You know? Yeah. Well, I think um, as a woman with biological children, I kind of feel weird calling myself a fertile woman. I was thinking about this. I know. Sorry. Episode. I don't know like, what words. No, 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 no. I, I was thinking about this, like, just like saying infertile woman and fertile woman. It's like, after all the conversations that we've had, I'm like, I don't feel like these words fit it's us. It's not. Yeah. No, it doesn't it fit. Doesn't. It feels, it's like, it's, it, that's. But that's a woman with one like, part of me, yeah, how do you, know? you, I know, I just, yeah, how I do know. you def, like it's, describe who you're talking about? I don't know. Well, and I was thinking the more I've gotten to know you, there is nothing infertile about you. I'm just like, I, it just, I don't, I don't know how to, no, yeah, I love anyway, that. these, these I lo- words don't fit. I love what you said too, we're having this conversation before is that our relationship is about so much more than motherhood. Mm-hmm. Can you talk, what were you, can you talk about what you meant by that? Well, before I get to that, I just wanted to say like for fertile women listening to this, like, okay, I, I really do think like, you know, women who have children, like we under, we just kind of culturally, we accept the struggles of women who have children because we see it, right? We kind of dumb as human beings. We really understand well what we see. We don't understand what we don't see. So fertile women, like, I, I think the onus is on us to kind of make the first move because you guys like infertile women are already carrying so much. Your pain is not seen. Your pain is not known. So fertile women put a little bit of the burden on you to be like, Hey, if you're struggling with infertility, don't go at her with like, Hey, have you heard of NAPRO technology? You're probably the 15th person who's told her about it. Um, you know, like don't apply the medical fix. Don't talk about so-and-so who just did breathing exercises and got pregnant. Okay. Like, you know, don't do the, just relax, actually ask her and, and go into this with the express purpose of listening. What is this like for you? How has it been? If you just go in with that, I'm not going to fix anything. I'm not going to change anything. I'm just going to listen. I think if that, if, if we start doing that, that will make a huge shift. Like if you make the first move and, and and maybe, maybe you don't know that your friend is infertile. Maybe you are one of those people who's like, well, she doesn't have any kids. She must be using condoms. I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, totally. just take, but again, one in six couples are infertile. Okay. They ain't all using condoms. Something else, something else is up. Okay. Um, just assume, assume the best of people assume that like, something's going on be like, Hey, how's it going? Don't ask her when she's going to have kids. Just ask her how she's doing see what happens. If you start to let her know you are interested in her as a person, you are interested in her heart. She will feel more comfortable and more safe to open up to you about those, those struggles. You don't even have to lead with like, Hey, I noticed you don't have any kids. How's that going for you? Just how are you doing? 
invest in her as a person. And, and this is, so to bring it full circle, what you were wanting to talk about is that the reason why I think this works well for us is because we don't focus on each other's motherhood. Like, yes, this is an important part, but we understand that our motherhood, it absolutely exists within the four walls of our home, but it is certainly not confined to it. And it's not limited to it. That our gifts and talents, who we are as women, and this this comes back to a holistic understanding, which is like what we love about fertility awareness is that we get this holistic understanding of personhood, who we are as persons, as people. Motherhood is a component of that. And, and as Catholics, you know, we believe that like motherhood is part of the feminine expression and it is not solely biological. And that, hey, fertile women, like Mary lit a fire under my butt. You know, it was kind of like, just because you have had biological children, you have not checked all the boxes for motherhood. You don't get a pass. Your motherhood extends beyond this. And, and for me personally, like I would not be satisfied if my motherhood was solely directed at my children. Like as, as beautiful and as wonderful as that expression of motherhood is, and I love it. And yes, it, it fulfills me so much, but it doesn't fulfill me completely, nor should it. I think as Catholic women, this is where we really, we need kind of a wake up call. Biological motherhood should not fully satisfy us. Because no human being can or should fully satisfy us. That's called idolatry. Quit it. She said it. (laughs) (laughs) She said it. She said Um, the quiet thing out loud. That's right. That's right. Yes. Now my first priority is my kids. Yes, absolutely. They, They get my first motherhood. They get the first fruits of my motherhood. They don't get the leftovers. Yes. But I still have leftovers after them. Where do those leftovers go? Am I just putting them on a shelf, letting them get dusty? Listen, we all know the parable of the talents. The one who buried his talent, it did not end well. We don't do that. We don't do that. So, but, but this is something I've learned from you. Is it, this is not, it's not that it's not enough. It's that it shouldn't be enough. It's that it's beautiful and it's wonderful, but no person should fully satisfy. You're you're more than that. And I think maybe some, maybe Catholic women hear that and and maybe interpret it as like, oh, but you're downplaying your motherhood. No, 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 no. What she's saying, what we're saying in no, in no means like snuffs out or like says this is like decreasing. So something else can increase. No, no, no. They, they both fulfill each other. Like they are mm-hmm. all fulfilling. And what you're describing too, like once you understand that and we have this dynamic in our friendship, it also naturally takes care of the other things that a lot of women complain about is that all conversations are around baby pregnancy schooling. That mm-hmm. is a huge, I mean, it's not just the three B's, baby showers, baptisms, and birthday parties. It is the day-to-day interactions that revolve around motherhood. Mm-hmm. And once you understand and kind of get out of that bubble and say, gosh, I'm, I'm so much more than this too. Like it is not, mm-hmm. this is not the only part of me. I have all these other parts of me um, that naturally goes away. And I just, I love yeah. that about our friendship is that we have, we talk about it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we talk about the, the struggles that we have in parenthood. Talk about a lot of other stuff too. A lot of other stuff yeah. that is unique to us and who we are. Yeah. And that is so life-giving. Yeah. Well, and, and how many conversations have we had about like, where I'm like, Mary, our families come first, business comes second. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I am like constantly beating and hammering that drum. We are recording this podcast while my two older kids are in school and my baby is sleeping. Okay. Yes. Like the, the family comes first. The family has been taken care of For sure. and, uh, and now we can, now we can pursue also, our, our mental health problems. and our hearts come first too. Oh yeah. Because we're not just marking about work we are are, and like if something comes up it's like I need to to take some time today to deal with this Mm -hmm. and we share about it with each other and that helps too so so yeah I think that's a good thing to point out too yeah that we and how many women do we know listen I know so many I I remember way back before I really started thinking about this in, in in this in this kind of way I remember like going to happy hours with mom friends and we 
have to take shots if we talked about our kids for more than 20 minutes. And we both drove there. So this was not an option. So right. we would like make a deal going in. <laughs> like, oh my we God. can't do shots. So like, all right, 20 minutes on the kids and then we got to move on. Like, this, is, this is a common thing that like, yeah, we, motherhood is beautiful. And yes, we do need to talk about it. We do need spaces where we can, we can vent about it. But we can't forget that, you know, our adopted biological foster, your kids, like whatever, whatever children you mother, whether they are within your home, whether they're your friends, like, I think, you know, we got to think of, if we think of motherhood as nurturing, you can mother coworkers, you can mother, don't mother your husband, that gets weird, but (laughs) (laughs) there are limits. Um, But if we just think about it in, in, in those terms, like, this is just who we are. This is, this is what we do. It's not, it's not limiting. It's not confining. It's not one thing. Like we take ideas and we give them life. We give them grounding. Like that's what we do. That's what we do as women. We give, we, we take something intangible and we make it tangible. Yes. Not to get a little theology of the body on it for I a mean, second, but, but like that's, I mean, there that's what we do. That's, that's what right we there. do. We, we have, have a space within us. We have a, a womb. We have a uterus that is empty until it's filled with new life. Mm-hmm. Right. And whether or not it's ever filled with new life, like we're still supposed to do, like, that's what we do. We make space. Why, make why is space. a baby the only thing we can co-create with God? Girl, no. I mean, no. why? God, God don't limit. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So God's infinite. He's infinite. I yeah. love it. I love it. We, you I know, I mean, I know we like, we want to, this is our, our organization is not Catholic, but we are. And um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we ain't going to hide it, but no. I, you know, I think explaining this in, in, in ways we always want to take kind of an educational approach, but anyway, um, no, I think we have so much to learn from each other. I think if we're, if we were to sum this up in a, in just something very dis- succinct, yeah, fertile women and infertile women, even though I said, I'm like, I don't really like these terms anymore. Yeah, we need to, <laughs> we'll figure it out. We gotta find new terms. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's better, but, um, yeah. we have so much to learn from each other. Yes. Yeah. We're not, I, I think that we think about, we live in such a divided world right now it's hard to find areas of unity but if if we're willing to do the hard stuff like the parts of our lives that are hard actually can be unifying they can bring us together when we're willing to make space for one another's hard when it's not this competition when it's like oh no i can see you and i i can't imagine completely what it's like to be you but i can see that this is hard, that it would be hard. And then when we're both doing that, like you and I, we've learned so much, like how, and we kind of touched on this in the beginning, but that the lessons that we learned from our very different experiences, nine times out of 10, they the same. Mm-hmm. We're just kind of wild. It is wild. Mm. I love it. Yeah. And then what a perfect way to close this. And just, we started off talking about our messy, right? And this is kind of the point is this vulnerability, this, this pain, this is the messy part. Mm-hmm. Having these conversations, this is a messy part. And this is what we want to bring that authenticity with our organization. So I think it, it fits right in. So we will leave y'all with that challenge. Um, what is your messy today? And if you end up having one of these conversations, um, it gets a little messy, know that that's okay. And, and we're right here with you. Y'all take care.